Hi there, and welcome to my beginner's guide for Wildemuth. I'm Icon, and this video will guide you through all you need to know to enjoy this wonderful tactical RPG. I'm going to wrap up the core gameplay mechanisms, I'm going to explain how the game works in general, and also add in a few things that I discovered while I was journeying through this magical world. At the beginning of the campaign, we can select three people. I am going to keep them like they are at this point and we're just going to start the story. You always start out by default with a warrior, a hunter and a mystic. These classes are at the first glance quite self-explanatory, but they are actually quite deep and versatile. The game's story is being told by these comics and they well we're going to skip over that story here at this point because if you want to enjoy story you rather play the game yourself what's important to know is that at the end of each of these chapters you get to fell a decision these decisions for example this one is defining how characters in my team are standing towards each other. We're going to select friendship and then we're going to wrap up into the first mission here. So the combat works like this. While your character is moving in the green slots, he's still able to act after moving. If you're moving him into the yellow slots, there's no only movement actions possible. Overall, your characters have two actions per turn. So basically, the green slots show you how far you can move during your first action, and if you decide to use your second action for movement as well, you get to use that. Here our job is to put out the fires. You always get the objectives shown up here. We're just going to going through a tutorial which is odd to show us how things work. Our next job is to open the door. We're just jumping over there and here we see opening a door is a so-called swift action. You see here down there with these icons how actions are working. Swift actions are free once per turn. That means you can do one swift action per turn and then the next swift action will cost you action points just like any other uh, else. So we are closing uh, into a friend. Now we choose a first weapon. Choose whatever you want. Every weapon has its own benefits or downsides and here the game shows us our enemy. So we have to kill the beast which is standing behind the door here. So one thing that I want to show you here is if your people are standing together they wall up which means they gain temporary armor bonuses which are really really good especially in the early game. So that means if you want to stay safe try to keep your characters close to each other at all times so now we go outside there and i highly recommend you to do as many half turns as possible before you actually act because this makes your life a lot easier so we're going to wait here for the monster to close in because i don't want to break the warning so we're going to shoot with catherine so here we see single action ends turn. There are actions which are just per se ending your turn. So if we want to move Catherine before she shoots, uh, we want to move Catherine this turn and shoot with her, we have to move her before she shoots. So unluckily the enemy dodged, so we're going to move Fen and Wall up again because I don't want this row to get Catherine blindsided. As you see here, the walling has saved us from some damage and now we can just get on in and attack. This is in basics, wow, unlucky, how the game is supposed to work. It's really easy, yet it does a lot of complexity, especially since we're now going to meet the second class. But before we do, here goes the level up. The level ups are what will define your character for real. So here we get to choose abilities for the warrior, Paladin, if he ends his turn by moving he will automatically enter Guardian which will attack enemies passing by, he can get a jump, he can get a attack which will intercept enemies that try to move past him. Choose whatever you want, specializations in this game are really really exciting and there's a lot of good stuff going on. There's basically nothing you can do wrong with these. The only thing I want to recommend is try to stick to a certain strategy. It's really more effective to 
stick to a certain idea and concept of a character than being all over the place. So we're going to teach Catherine the, the art of archery, which gives her counter attacks if she or adjacent allies get attacked, which brings you to the point where walling is even more effective. So we get an item which we can equip or salvage, we're going to equip that, and then we get to the end of the story, and here we get to choose how we're standing to our third person in the party, which will be introduced in the next event. I'm playing here the intro tutorial mission because it's really well wrapped up for a tutorial. So here we are at the core map. This is where the overmap gameplay is working out. So we see here at Dawny Guard, these icons show you how, what resources this place will yield after the campaign is over. So to explore places, we simply click there. And just like in combat, we have a certain amount of buttons to choose from. Here we only get to scout out this area. While scouting, we can select who's going to do that. And let's go. Since we don't have as many people, later in the game you can have way more people. And that's where it go grows more interesting to have more squads and a more, ex uh, a more specialized uh, management. So here we get to meet our third party member. I'm skipping through that, please forgive me for that. It's a really cool story, but it's not part of the tutorial here. And here we get to choose the weapon for our Mystic. And the Mystic is a really cool class, which is very, very individual. And that's why I guess the game is showing you the class all on her own. And I really thought it was a good choice to do that for the tutorial video here as well. Mystics get to interfuse with their environment. Interfusion can be done with all these highlighted objects. And as you see here, there's different things that you can do with them. A metal item can be used for shackle effects. A coat rack, which is a wood item, can be used for splitter blast effects. Mystics are all about using the environment to attack their enemies. So we're now using this thing and we're destroying it. So interfusions can always be done as a swift action once per turn. And this means a mystic can move, interfuse, and attack in the same turn, which is really powerful and viable. Just keep in mind that whenever you use your interfusions, the environmental items lose HP while they get used up. So here we also see another thing that I want to talk about. This rager has these blue icons, these depict armor. On the other side, Yorlin has a, blue, a purple shield which is warding. Every point of armor scrapes off one point of physical damage, so one shield negates one point of damage, and one purple shield negates one point of magical damage. So the Splinter Blast has a shredding effect which and a piercing effect. Piercing ignores armor, shredding destroys armor. So with, this, with these actions you can soften up your enemies before you go in with people that don't have these effects. The Mystic is really focused about interfusions a lot, but you can of course do different builds. Since this game is always randomizing your choices, it's not easy to say you should go for this build or you should go for this build. Rather, I'd advise you to take the perks that sound interesting for you, especially if you're new to the game, and try to follow these. So here we can learn to apply upgrades to the metal and tool and shard um, interactions. So we're going to pick that one. The Mystic is a really interesting character class and is a lot of fun to use because it's not your standard magic user. Instead, you have a environmental an, an environment manipulator who's going crazy on your enemies in lots of different ways and 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 I enjoyed this a really really high amount okay so now we get back to the manager part our next objective is to assault Lignetta's keep as you see here there's a flag where you can just assign these people to attack or we can also click the tile here and we see here that we can also do things at these 
areas. If we zoom out here, we can see that the world is a little bit larger than that. But we can right now only see Lignetta's Keep. So we're going to get into that, into this fight. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about team strategies now. So here we get to choose how to fight this, Courages or Stoically. We're going to go for a Courages approach, which will yield us different bonuses here. Courage gives us plus two damage for three turns. So. I want to talk about the characters here for a moment, especially the stats. I already explained armor and warding. Dodge is a flat out uh, ability to just dodge physical attacks. It is again pitted against enemy accuracy, so the higher your accuracy, the more you can counteract enemies dodge. And block is also another way of negating physical attacks. As you can see here, this game has a lot of ways of negating physical attacks and therefore accuracies are quite important if you want to stay viable with your characters. Another thing that I want to point out here is stunt. Stunt is basically the same thing as in other games, a critical hit. And last but not least, there's potency. It's this damage added to your interfusion attacks. So potency is entirely only interesting for your mystics. Beyond that, there's other stats which are influencing the story, but that's all roleplay fluff. Keep, keep also in mind that your character's health is not automatically regenerating after a fight. You have to wait for a couple of days. If somebody dies, he really dies. So if you don't want to live through that pain, save and load accordingly. So now for a regular fight, I really like to put up my fighter up front and put him into sentinel, sentinel mode. Because that means whenever an enemy tries to pass by Fen, he's going to get smacked. Also, if you do a bad choice here, there's the undo move function, which is, well, the game calculates how often you do that at the end of a, uh, at the end of a story, but, you know. Also keep in mind that after Catherine has moved, I can now select Yorlin and move her as well, and now I can not act with Catherine again. So you don't necessarily need to complete every turn for the character completely. So, now we're going to interfuse with the bookshelf here, because that's just a good thing, or now we're going to take the statue. Unlock the discus, and let's see if I can attack somebody. No, I can't. Keep in mind that when interfused with an item, the mystic also gains a little bit of an extra vision around that. Here I want to talk about the Silk Step skill from the Hunter, which makes him enter the Grey Plane, which is actually just the same, it translates as Stealth. So, while in Grey Plane, your characters can be seen by enemies and they can ignore armor while doing that, which is pretty cool on itself. So, now, next turn, we're going to use the Discus on this guy. And here we see how the Mystic can already do a lot of damage before the fight has actually started. Fen doesn't need to do anything. We're now going to put Catherine up, up front here, give her a shot. We see up here, you see the hit chance, the damage, and the, the chance of stunt happening. Alright, we finished that fight. And we have another victory. And that's basically how the combat works. Of course, the enemies grow stronger over time, and you have to work out with these. We're going to equip these potency items on the Mystic, because, like I explained, potency is a Mystic trait. And yeah, now we get a choice how to call our characters, our party, and now the actual game unlocks. After a combat is won, calamities get rolled. Calamities. Here we see Gorgon, Rager 1. This means the Gorgon faction can now use the, the monsters called Ragers. You see here that the... which monsters can be spawned and Calamities can, will also ultimately empower the monsters. So, after this is all being done, we get into the free open world area. Lignetta's Keep can now be secured and when we do that, we can provide, it provides us resources. In these scenarios, you always get to choose either to find an item or work faster. As we see here, 
Working faster can be of importance because there is now a timer running until the next Calamity card is being played. And whenever that happens, your enemies grow stronger. So we're now securing Linea's Keep and we get these resources. And as you see here, that's now being done. Now we can scout out the environment. You always see the next goal which you need to find highlighted like that. And now we can scout out these areas and that's our overworld and exploration part. Keep in mind while you do this, time is working against you. There's also later incursions happening when you find infested tiles. That's when monsters will launch own attacks and try to conquer your your grids and when they do that successfully they'll destroy the buildings we just uh, like Lignetta's keep we secured that they would destroy that and then you would get no resources at the end of the chapter at the end of the chapter when all the quests are done you can unlock new items for your characters and you can use these resources to upgrade your items so the basic core mechanic of the game here is to challenge you to pick up as many of these locations as possible while not taking too many because the more calamity cards the game puts on you the harder the the monsters will be to be beaten so now we can explore the next place and as we see here our job is it to clear all hostile sites well we can also scout out new areas. Keep in mind that you also can just scout one area with one hero and the other two heroes can go somewhere else. Here it's all up to you how you proceed. You can also recruit new characters here for legacy points. Legacy points are something that I want to explain for a second here. They are basically like joker points. You can use legacy points to upgrade your gear after a chapter, but you can also use legacy points to prevent calamity cards spawning. As we see here, after 103 car, uh, days, a calamity will spawn on us. And when these will spawn, we can use the legacy points to prevent a few things. So, as we see here now, there's a lot of combat sites spawning around us, but I've already explained the combat more than enough i think here this part of the game is quite simple but also pretty deep as we see here we can also check out the enemy's strength and when you click these you get a little bit of highlighter where they're sitting at these are the monsters that are lurking at these places so while you are exploring the world, new events will spawn at every every place you um, will encounter, and also you will be living through events that are happening because of the story between your characters. As you saw here, two people fell in love. Sometimes they find old curses from their uh, family lineage. There's all manner of different things happening, random events spicing up the gameplay here. As we see here, now the first infestations happened and now incursions will happen. I want to do one thing which you shouldn't do, just sitting around doing nothing and wait until the first calamity spawns because this will be already the end of our beginner's tutorial. So here we spawn our first opportunity for an adventure. This just happens sometimes. This is a adventure focused around Fen. Thanks RNG for giving me this opportunity. These are unique and every one of these adventures will define the personality of your character a little bit more and it will emphasize his story, flesh out something which happens and at the end of these you always get to choice uh, get to choose if you want to follow the story arc or delay it the second choice is usually the delaying thing and the uh, first choice is go for that adventure as we see here these two are locked because they are influent they are tiered to that uh, adventure and now they're going to go over there to experience whatever the story has in the store for them. So, calamities! As we see here, there's different things happening. There are two types of calamities. 
First type is making just the monsters stronger, as we see here. All raccoon enemies will now be enchanted by Corrupt Path, which makes them do something. Also, we see here empowerments, all the more thagi, no, the, the spectic monsters are empowered here. And what's most important, here's a Watchman tier one. This will introduce a completely new monster to this faction. I personally made the experience that these are quite worth it to be cancelled out, but be reasonable with that. For example, the story I'm playing here is focused around the Gorgon faction. I would be better off focusing on denying new Gorgon creatures than denying new creatures here. Don't overspend your legacy points at this point, but if you can prevent dangerous monsters from spawning altogether, you can make your campaign a lot easier. So we're going to do this like that and like that, and when we do this, you see new calamities spawn here, and this will stay like that. These calamities will stay over the chapters of a story. Every story is usually spread across three or five chapters, so it's up to you if you want to clear out the map completely, level up your characters as much as possible, and risk harder calamities hitting you a lot harder, or rushing through the story and ending with a rather weak party. It's up to you. The real difficulty for this game is to find the proper balance between greed and licking out every corner of this game and staying focused into the story and not getting too distracted by things. Okay, so last but not least, I want to talk about what happens after a story. Your characters that survive the story will go into a legacy pool. The legacy pool, well, let's uh, go right into there. Um, let's see, I'm going to meet you at the legacy pool. The legacy pool is where your old legends meet. These are all characters from my old stories. These characters can spawn in your new stories, and they can be even higher. So basically, your world grows richer with every adventure you have experienced in Wildermyth. And that's a really cool part, because as we see here, this character is only a level 1 warrior. She's the daughter of two of my characters, and if you don't like any character, you can always forget them. So, as we see here, Bria has even some some mutilations I wanted to say but it's not exactly that so the longer you play this game the more memor memorable or the more interesting characters will be here and influence your story in a way Wildemuth is a big story generator just like games like RimWorld are and that's what I really really like about this game so that sums up the tutorial I hope that was kind of helpful for you the last thing I want to talk about is here if you want to experience not too much reading I can highly recommend the procedural generated chapter thingies and yeah that's it Feel free to drop your comments down below. If there are any questions, ask away. I'd be more than happy to answer. Leave a thumbs up if that video was somehow helpful for you. And also, if you like that content, check out my channel. I do daily videos, so there's most likely something in store for you. So just subscribe and turn on those notifications. Also, feel free to check out the description links down there. You'll find there my Twitch channel where I do daily streams too. And also, if you want to give me a helping hand, there's also ways and means to support, uh, support me with coffee or other ways. It's up to you. Advertisement block is over. Thank you so much for watching and have fun. See you soon. Bye-bye.